Hi everyone, in this video I'm going to talk about third degree price discrimination. And in general, if I was going to give a really brief summary, if a firm knows that the consumers in its market are made up of different types, if the firm can identify which type any of their individual consumers belongs to, and if they can prevent what we call arbitrage, well then the firm can charge different prices to their different types of consumer for the same product, and that will be them engaging in third degree price discrimination. So let's talk about each of these points in turn. To say that our consumers are made up of different types is just to say that our consumers are not identical. They differ in terms of their willingness to pay for the product, so in their demand. Now, sometimes courses and textbooks might talk about this in terms of differing elasticities of demand, which is just to really say that their demand differs. And in this case, we can talk about averages since it's absolutely plausible to think that no one consumer is identical, but we might think on average, some types of consumers just have a lower or higher willingness to pay relative to others. Now, the classic example here is cinema tickets. The cinema knows that lots of different types of people see films and they might distinguish especially between, say, students as well as non-student standard adults. Now, it's reasonable to suggest that our students have a lower willingness to pay for cinema tickets compared to non-student adults. And this is because students are likely to be on a relatively low income. It makes sense that if they're working at all, they're probably only working part time in order to make time for study. Now, if we drew out demand curves for each of our type of consumer, perhaps they will look something like this. The demand curve on the left hand side, that's for our students. You can see it's smaller than the demand on the right hand side. That's the demand of our non student adults. We can see then that our non-student adults have a higher willingness to pay for cinema tickets relative to students. Now, if we profit maximize over these two curves, so we draw in a marginal revenue curve for each of our types and we'll put in our marginal cost, we can find the optimal quantity to sell to each type by setting the marginal revenue associated with each of our types equal to marginal cost. We read the price of our demand curve and we can see that the optimal prices are different between our two types of consumers. In particular, P star subscript A, that's our optimal price for our, our adults, our non-students, is greater than P star S, the optimal price for students. It would be best for the firm to charge the students a lower price than our non-student adults. In particular, our cinema can offer a student ticket that's discounted uh, in comparison to a standard non-student adult ticket. Now, of course, dividing up our consumers like this only works if the firm can identify when various consumers come into their shop or present themselves to the firm, which type any individual consumer belongs to. Otherwise, the firm just won't be able to tell who to give which price to. In our example, the cinema can know who is a student because students have identification cards and actually identification cards are pretty good identifiers. ID cards can help identify lots of different groups that might matter to firms if they're price discriminating like this. So for instance, pensioners, or if a person works somewhere special like the army or the police or, or, or they're part of the ambulance, or if they're a member of a club or organization. So ID cards are good identifiers here. Another interesting way the firm might be able to identify consumers as being of a specific type or not is by location. So a firm might understand that the demand for their product in some country, say country A, is kind of high relative to another country, country B. And so where the consumer lives or where they order from, talking about online sales, that can indicate which type a consumer belongs to. Lastly, other sorts of official documentation can help identify consumer types. For instance, an enrollment number or even an institutional email address can identify consumer types. I remember, for instance, when I was studying, I got access to a cheaper version of statistical software 
thank you starter, but I did have to provide evidence of my enrollment and I did that via my institutional email. Now, even if we can identify all of our consumers properly into our different types, however, the firm still faces the possibility that the consumer is facing that lower price could potentially resell what they buy to the consumers facing the higher price and they can do that at a profit. This is called arbitrage and that's our third point. The firm has to be able to prevent arbitrage. And in our example, the cinema might, for instance, decide that they sell a standard adult ticket at $15, but students can buy a discounted ticket at $8. Well, in this case, what's to stop a student buying a ticket for $8 and reselling that ticket to a non-student adult for say $12? The student would make $4 of surplus through this trade since they only had to pay $8 for the ticket, but they sold it for 12. The adult would get a surplus of $3 because they would get a ticket for $12 instead of having to pay 15. If arbitrage is possible, then third degree price discrimination will not work because the consumers will have an incentive to circumvent and avoid the higher price and no one will end up paying the higher price. Now our cinema can prevent arbitrage through just requiring that consumers present their ID, which identifies them as students when they enter the cinema, if they're asked. Other ways of preventing arbitrage could include, for instance, tariffs or transport costs. If a producer wants to set different prices across different countries, they may be protected from the possibility of arbitrage. If there is a large transport cost or tax on imports, uh, this could prevent the lower price consumer reselling to the higher price consumer just because that transfer of the product becomes expensive. Alternatively, there could be legal consequences or other implications associated with reselling, like a void on a warranty associated with a product if it's resold. So these sorts of things can make arbitrage unattractive and can allow firms to go ahead and engage in third degree price discrimination. Now, I will say just before I finish this video, sometimes courses or textbooks do differentiate between second degree price discrimination and third degree price discrimination exactly along these lines. So they'll say something like second degree price discrimination is when the firm knows that their consumers are of different types, but they can't identify which group a particular individual belongs to and they can't prevent arbitrage. So then the firm in this case will create a menu of options with the hope that the consumers self-select into different options revealing their type. And that's what happens in second degree price discrimination. In third degree price discrimination though, the firm has everything it needs to be able to successfully segment their market. That being said, some courses and textbooks just don't talk about second degree price discrimination this way. They only talk about second degree price discrimination as, as block pricing essentially. So that distinction may or may not be useful for you. I do hope this video helped though. If it did, please like and subscribe. Thank you so much for watching. Have a good one.